thank you all for coming. Thank you for having me here. You report this really wonderful. Um, I'm going to be presenting a juvenilia sandwich, so I'll be reading a piece of juvenilia, something I wrote when I was many years ago, and then I'll be reading from uh, this book, Meeting the Tormentors in Safeway and Let the Empire Down. Um, Please do buy my books, not because I think I'm fabulous, because otherwise I'm flying Porter Airways home and I'll have to pay uh, 77 bucks to a like, check bag. <laughs> oh. So buy them all. <laughs> um, I'm going to begin with a piece of Juvenalia um, written in, it's the only free verse poem, one of the only free verse poems I've ever written in my life. And it's written in the voice of my husband, who uh, is a tall, pursuit serb, who said to me once, you are not allowed to have any presents unless I gave them to you. <laughs> and any piece of clothing that I'd received from like, anyone, especially if they'd been a guy, was like, you look like shit in that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it sort of half-heartedly joking uh, as well. Um, so I'm going to begin with Ned's Trainers. Uh, trainers meaning running shoes. Okay. Ned's trainers. How many times do I have to tell you to get rid of those trainers? I'll buy you new shoes. Buy you many, many pairs. What are you doing on Saturday? We'll go shopping. <laughs> do I keep things my ex-girlfriends gave me? I'm tired of hearing about Ned, his hair, and his nice bike, and his horrible installation art, those giant white boxes that light up, that the Canada Council gives him money to build. <laughs> Did the Canada Council give him the money so he could buy you those trainers? <laughs> those trainers are ugly. For one thing, they're white. They're all white. And they're dirty. What are you, a nurse? A dirty nurse? They look cheap. They age you. And they make you look like you're going to start running. And I'm going to have to beg you to come back. <laughs> so, um, I was bullied in school when I was, uh, until I was about 15 years old, actually. And uh, has anyone here uh, ever run into sort of an undesired schoolmate as an adult somewhere else? You know what that's, you know, you know what that's like. I ran into like this horrific bully from boarding school. I ran into her in a supermarket, and of course they're like, oh, hi! <laughs> oh my god! Mr. Savage! You just want to like, pick up a frozen cheesecake and bludgeon them to death. <laughs> um, so anyways, this is called, uh, and if your name is Jennifer or Lynn or Catherine, this is not about you, I'm sorry. <laughs> Meeting the tormentors in Safeway. They all had names like Jennifer or Lynn or Catherine. They all had bone blonde hair that wet, flat cut with bangs. They pulled your chair from underneath you, shoved their small fists in your face. Too soon you knew it would begin those minkish teeth like shrapnel in the air, the bacchic taunts, the Herculean dare, their soccer cleats against your porcine shin, that laugh which sounded like a hundred birds escaping from a gunshot through the reeds. And now you have to face it all again. The joyful, freckled faces lost for words in supermarkets as those red hands squeeze your own. It's been so long, they say. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Way back in the, 
in the punk scene, okay, my very best friend had a sort of trial by fire that she would use when um, she had like new fella. And what she would do is, the morning after a moor, she would send the guy to the corner shop, which was actually called Omar's Maxi Milk, and she would make him wear a long cape with nothing underneath. Like when she would send him to get like the morning breakfast stuff wearing the cape with nothing underneath. And if he survived, then he got another chance. Right? So this is called the test cape. <laughs> I've landed on a way to try you out and gauge your mettle. Please put on this cape. It's far too late to think about escape. I'd like you now to venture out without your other clothes. The cape will have to do. Go down to Omar's Maxi Milk and buy a pack of Belmont Miles. And would you try to see if they have raisin bread? Milk too. When you reach across to get the change, contrive a little conversation. Muse about the way the Raiders always lose. Say thank you. Take your time and rearrange your stuff inside the bag. And please, try not to panic. You'll need Herculean force to pull it off. You are aware, of course, it's August and it's criminally hot. And Omar has that huge electric fan <laughs> from the film set just last week. If you are not arrested as a freak, I'll know you are no ordinary man. <laughs> this is a poem called Sexual History. Um, sort of, this is the version I told my husband, like, you know, like, was there anyone before you? Oh, no. <laughs> Sexual History. Under my window, they stood with their hands waving tickets to Carmen and keys to the Porsche. They had cups full of sugar and cables to start up the car in the parking lot, matches and pens, and the right time of day on the path in the park. They were gentle with animals, children and plants, and used words like forever and always and now. When they vanished, their feet walked away with no sound in the past, in the dark, under wraps, underground. Oh, the men before you, they were tow-haired and tall. Oh, the men before you, they were square and morose. They had back wings for souls and racks of gray teeth and a family somewhere that I'd never meet. They had hundreds of poker chips stacked by the bed, and instead of declaring their love made them weak, they would give me commands through their suffering phones, using words like don't know and unsure and not now, hanging up, leaving only the feeling of down. Oh, they did me a favor, the men for you, as they dug themselves deep in the past underground. Wow. Anyone here have to use a laundry room in their building? Anyone here have to use a la or a laundromat? Yeah, you know what that's like, right? We still use the laundry room. Uh, everyone knows cheer, laundry detergent cheer? Okay, you've got that here as well. This one is called How Are You Bunny? And Bunny standing in the laundry room, her mottled knuckles round a jug of cheer. A year ago, it would have been Ron here, but now the park below is in full bloom, and Ron is gone. Mm -hmm. They took away his chair, his IV stand, his magazines, his stains, the view he loved, the lake, the rusting cranes. None of this, of course, is my affair. The sordid load I toss to chase my words, but none will do. 
No sentiments out clean, the leading brand, that bastard, Mr. Death. Outside, the wires throng with grimy birds. I hear it as she shuts the last machine. I'm fine to no one on her change-cold breath. There's nothing uh, quite, am I good for, oh good, I'm good for time, that's good. There's nothing worse than um, dating a complete asshat. <laughs> I'm sure we've all done it. Um, everyone knows the mythological story of Galatea, Pygmalion, Pygmalion, King Pygmalion, fashioned a beautiful woman out of alabaster, and he dressed the statue in jewels and clothes and lay her down on a Tyrian purple couch and had his animate way with inanimate her, and then Venus turned her into a real woman, and all turned out in the end. This poem is called The Classics Lesson. <clears throat> I told him about Galatea, the joyful animated queen. He told me, make it short, I have three discs of porn I haven't seen. <laughs> I told him she was fashioned by Pygmalion's skilled and lonely hand. He told me that's the kind of thing a guy could never understand. I told him that he whispered pleas and vows into her chilly ear. He answered, where's the damn remote and who forgot to buy the beer? I told him that he brought her shells and little birds and shining stones. He told me, get a pad and pen, I'll need them when my agent phones. I told him that he laid her out in purple on a gilded chaise. He told me, I'll be working late tonight and for the next five days. I told him that he went to pray for someone like his sculpted one. He said, the baby wrecked your boobs. If I were you, I'd get them done. I told him that he hurried home and pressed her to his pounding heart. He said the therapist was right, that we could use some time apart. I told him that she came to life and both lived loving evermore. He told me, damn, I'm out of smokes. I'll go and get some at the store. He told me, I forgot my keys. He told me, hey, it's 10 below. He told me, open this damn door. I told him, no. I told him, no. <laughs> Thank you. Um, before my 20th high school reunion, my husband got me my first digital camera. And you were seeing those bloody things? Like, I like film. Like, you know, and there was a manual, and half of it was in Japanese, and it was like all these different settings, you know, like, Here's how you photograph, like, uh, fireworks. And this is the setting for photographing things in a jeweler's cabinet. And this is the setting for photographing sports. And this is the setting for photographing elementary school sports. And this is the, you know, there are all these different settings. And you're like, whatever happened to point and click? So uh, this poem is called Modern Camera. This is the setting for when you're inside. This is the setting for candlelight. This is the setting for sunrise and sunsets. This is for portraits of people at night. This is the setting for servings of food. This is the setting for things under glass. This is the setting for files and documents. This is the setting for flowers and grass. This is the setting for watching explosions. This is the setting for watching the match. This is the setting to hold the spy hall and see children cry when you fastened the latch. This is the setting for trembling hands. This is the setting for earthquakes and fire. This is the one for the tyrant in training. You cower below them and tilt the lens higher. This is the setting for rocks and hard places. This 
is the setting for blood and ablution, and this button here is the one that you press when shooting yourself is the only solution. <laughs> this, um, I just got news, this is my last book I'm going to read from, uh, and it has just been shortlisted for the Pat Lowther Memorial Award again. So I'm really thrilled about that. Um, it's very exciting for me and for my publisher, Biblio Oasis. And um, I'm going to read a poem called Plans. Plans is about manicures. Um, and I want to just uh, give a little vocabulary. Thornton's Classics is a brand of chocolates you get in the UK. It's like black magic. So it's sort of, it's not good dialects, Thornton's Classics, you know what I mean? You know, there's a huge sort of encyclopedic guide to, you know, which is the Brazil nut, which is the nasty cherry and syrup and all that. Hello is a gossip magazine. You know, so if you want to hear about what Prince Albert's doing, buy hello. Um, plans. Mid-morning, here I sit with splayed out hands, womanly and worked with on the towel. The manicurist, 20 at the most, is pretty in her bow-necked carbon dress. The shop has not been open for a week. A box of Thornton Classics stands uneaten on a table by a copy of Hello. She has a job. Someone has told her so. If she were made to do it, she's uncertain. And if she were uncertain, would she speak? Plucking metal clippers from a glass, she starts to pick away, a little lost, until the rip, the blood, the muted howl, I'm sorry, meaning not what I had planned. A half an hour ago, this girl had told me how she loved her small town school back home, excelled in sciences, rejoiced in donning lab coats to untuck the life from frogs, set fire to wide hip flasks, lean in to watch the magnified amoebae wink and burble, coiling in the petri dish, a hand unshaking on the arm of her best friend. A girl's future should be full and bright, a marvel. But alas for her, there is a catch. We take on the immediate. Hope flags. Wishing to be wise and come out shining, we pop a beaker over our own flame. We do it cheerfully. We do it coldly. Tamping down the soggy, trembling cotton on my bleeding cuticle, she asks, what color? Meaning, how can I do better when I know the business isn't in me? Look, I want to say, I've done it too. Sold candlesticks I'd never care to clean. Told women that a lipstick made them young. Gone drinking with the after hours gang. I've told admirers things I didn't mean and said to students, it'll come to you. The wrong direction never treats you kindly. I long to tell her that it doesn't matter. There is a way to live and shirk the axe, though what that is, I've probably forgotten. When I, we used to live in uh, Scotland, and we used to watch all these incredibly violent um, English and Scandinavian cop shows, usually in bed, um, usually in bed, and um, one thing we watched was Luther. Has anyone seen Luther? Yeah, it's Thank you. It's, um, and I have to, uh, once this poem came out, the producer of Luther asked for a copy, actually. He got one. Watching the cop show in bed. Apparently, it's very, very bad to let a well-dressed man into your home. An Oxbridge accent coupled with the claim your husband's hurt and he's from Scotland Yard. Disaster! He'll thunk and chloroform you, drag you off at knife point to his boat, exsanguinate your body, write some smut from Crowley on the walls, then eat your leg. <laughs> He'll leave the rest of you inside a freezer to be discovered by a sad detective bellowing, we made it here too late. Too late indeed, 
I used to feel wiser, more in charge, a little more creative. Now, like the rest, I watch the door and wait. Um, I want to say, uh, how is, is two more good? Is two more, is two more good? Oh my gosh, all right. So uh, I'm going to read, first of all, when I was a kid, I was a goth, right? It's hard to tell looking at me now. It's like Mary Sunshine, right? So I used to be goth when I was a kid, and I was always like, I didn't like Barbie, I didn't like sort of strapping blonde, like, you know, Ken, you know, flashing teeth, guys with big pecs. I liked really scrawny, depraved looking guys, right? Like punk rock guys are wonderful, like, I've got cat skins driving on the radiator in my bedroom, you know? And, uh, and especially, so I loved villains. So I'd be watching a film and I'd be like, oh, show me the villain, right? And so this poem is called um, The Villains. I always went for darkness as a girl. Those ashy Europeans wrapped in capes, glazed ranks of zombies browsing in the mall, the cabin dwelling fan with swelling hopes, her novelist in reach. I don't know why I lean toward the viper in the mink, the tortured trader in the Chave tie, lancet prime to disembowel the bank. Bad. So bad, a shudder more than human. When will we see their dreadful likes again? The drips who map the older starlet's ruin, or herded virgins into wicker men. The hazmat-suited soldiers come for you, the pork pie preacher targeting the young for hidden money, crossing the bayou, white knuckles flashing love and hate. How come? Could it be that daybreak lay ahead, with sunny buses, clinking streams of coins, the people taking lunches nearly dead, waiting for their sandwiches in lines, that muttering backs were hovering in bars, that children were deciding what to leave, that cubicles had manacles and ears, and you, with nothing left to do but drive toward the setting sun, your rosebud home, the neighbors you can't fathom or forgive, then up the stairs to the crib in the back room, containing something awful and alive. So I'm going to end with another piece of Juvenilia. Um, I have a very, very close friend. Now she's got a steady partner and stepkids and stuff. But her big sort of thing, I don't know if you've ever known anyone like this, was whenever she went on a date, she would tell the guy everything that she'd done and everything that had happened and everything, you know, every scrape she'd been in, you know, like I've got a rash on my whatever. And, and so she'd give, she'd give everything away on the first date. I don't know, which sometimes can be a good thing, but sometimes is not a good thing. So uh, this is a very old poem, and it's called I Beg You. And I'm gonna leave you with this, and I would like to just thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to the Newburyport Festival for having me. Alfred, thank you so much, the wonderful volunteers. I'm having such a great time. And uh, to the readers before, this has been such a great privilege. And, um, uh, stay classy in the report. Okay. okay, so I beg you. Never make your heart an open book. Never throw yourself at any man. Don't track him in the supermarket with smiles or block him and his shopping in the aisles to point out something printed on a can. <laughs> Never find his address in the book and drive out there to, well, just take a look, as you'll get caught. And then he'll tell his mates, you're probably the spawn of Norman Bates. <laughs> Never make your heart an open book. Never tell the quarry all your fears. 
Never say you're terrified of slugs or going bald and springing for those plugs unless you want it all to end in tears. Your wretched dark versions to the elevator doors closing as you plunge on past those 27 floors can stuff themselves, my friend, for I can tell you in the end, a man is full of panic and he has no time for yours. <laughs> Never make your heart an open book. Never talk about the ones before. Never blather on about your ex, his liver, and the soul-destroying sex you had upon his parents' bathroom floor. <laughs> Spare the details of your last divorce. Though he may nod and sagely mutter, brute, it's tossing at him strange and bitter fruit. The bastard's never going to get a hoot out of who got the house, the kids, the horse. Never make your heart an open book. Never tell your men folk how you feel. Never phone them up when you are high and tell them that without them you would die as most would rather crush beneath a wheel or climb towards a mess of power lines than face another heap of valentines, a droning ballad, picnic in the park, or weepy tantric yoga in the dark. I know it's hard to stomach this, but I suggest you try. We champion the truth, perhaps, but really, when it comes to chaps, they seem to like it better when you lie. <laughs> Thank you.